Hello and welcome to RESTful and HTTP APIs in the Pyramid Web Framework. This is your host, author, instructor, Michael Kennedy, and I'm really excited to share all the ways that Pyramid makes an awesome RESTful API platform. Let's start with a quick overview and big picture of where we're going and the power of APIs. So we have our web application. It's running over here on some servers, probably has a web app section, probably talks to a database, right? Now, people are gonna come using their browsers and make requests to our website. So maybe they're over here on their MacBook or they're on their phone and they're gonna request directly to our HTML pages. That's gonna talk to our database. Great stuff comes back, right? Here's our page. You can you know, watch our courses if this is a course site, whatever, right? Now, however, what if we have a native app? What if we have other servers that want to talk machine to machine? Technically, we could use web scraping, but it's really a bad idea. <laughs> this is not the way it should work to get at that data. Instead, we want to set up a separate channel specifically for these types of systems. We want to set up an API, probably HTTP talking JSON. But as we'll see, there's a lot of options here, and maybe we want to vary that as well. So now if we have this API, our native app can pull the data in in a very efficient format and drive the native app itself. Similarly, our servers might be able to talk directly to our server using this API. So this is one of the primary reasons that we want to create APIs is we want to take our website or our data and expose it to things not just for humans, but for machines, for applications, for other machines, and so on. Let's look at another example. Here we have a big monolithic web app, this big blue cube, and it's just one giant web application. One of the trends these days is to create more smaller services, often referred to as microservices. So maybe we want to break the functionality of our app up into little pieces. Maybe one of these is in charge of user authentication and login. One of these little services, a separate web app, is in charge of charging credit cards. One does logging. Uh, one pulls back data from you know some API elsewhere. Things like that. How do these talk to each other? Well, very much like our native app, they're going to use services to glue these microservices together. So if you want to build awesome APIs using the Pyramid Web Framework, that's what this course is all about. And it's very comprehensive. It turns out that we're going to cover pretty much all the things that you might want to do with APIs. What exactly are you going to cover? Good question. Let's start at the beginning. We're going to talk about why HTTP and why the RESTful principles behind some of these services are useful and we should follow them. Then we're going to start by creating our initial web application. At this point, there'll be nothing API specific about it, but APIs run generally inside web applications. They just talk a little bit differently than the standard web app does. We'll write our first HTTP service, and this is going to be a read-only service that exchanges JSON only. We'll have a couple of endpoints, and we'll do some interesting things here, but we're not going to create new data. We're not going to modify data, things like that. It's just going to be read-only. Then we'll take a little bit of a diversion from the server side to look at two ways in which we can call these services. We're going to see how we can call the service that we just created with Python and also how to consume it within our web application using JavaScript. Next up, we're going to build a nearly RESTful service. And I say nearly because describing something as a RESTful service or not, it's not a, a Boolean answer. It's more like a spectrum, right? So we'll go most of the way, let's say 85, 90% the way towards what you might consider a RESTful service at this point. And then one of the things we're going to add is the ability to have more than just basic JSON or HTML responses. What if we want CSV? What if we want images? What if we want XML? We'll see how we can take what's built in a pyramid and extend it to add all these different response types. Once you have multiple response types, maybe you want to let the client, not the server, decide what response it's going to get. So with content negotiation, we can look at what accept type, what content type the client is suggesting that they get. So some clients will say, I'd prefer JSON. We can configure our system through content negotiation to automatically return JSON objects. Now, if the same service is called the same API and everything, but indicating that you'd like to get, say, an image, maybe we'll return an image instead of JSON, right? So we'll see how that works in this content negotiation section. At this point, you're going to see that our APIs, while working wonderfully, are going to be quite busy. There's going to be a lot of stuff going on inside those API methods with validation, with object creation, with interacting with the stuff coming off the wire, transforming and so on. And we can move much of that to isolated classes that are dedicated 
specifically to managing this and we'll have much cleaner separation between our validation and the actual implementation of our API. So we'll do that with this thing I'm calling view models. At this point, we'll have been working with just fake data in memory, but it's time to get real and have a real database with persistence and all those sorts of things. So we're gonna be adding SQL Alchemy, talking to a SQL Lite database here and doing proper inserts and transactions and all of that sort of stuff at this level. So we'll do a quick intro to SQL Alchemy and then we'll convert our in-memory model to a data-driven database model. In addition to real data, we might want to restrict who has access to do what. So we'll see how we can add a level of authentication to our services. Finally, we probably want to figure out what has happened on our API. What are people doing? Are there any errors? Could I get notified in real time of any server-side crashes? So in this chapter, we'll see all, all the techniques and tools we can use to make that happen. So. At this level, we pretty much have a really nice working application, but how do people get to it? Well, APIs live out on servers on the internet, right? So the next thing we're gonna do is focus on deployment. We're gonna create a Linux server, set up Nginx and MicroWSGI to serve this in a very realistic and high performance way. And once we get everything up and working, we probably want people to consume our API. So we'll talk about some of the options and techniques for documenting our operations. And that's what we're covering in this course. I think this is quite comprehensive and I hope you find it to be really interesting and engaging. Thanks for joining this course. Now let's get your machine all set up so you're ready to follow along.